with that, I'm going to step into the presentation. Uh, a little bit about me. Yeah, it's uh, this picture is a couple of years old, and uh, I've gained a couple more years of experience, hopefully different experience, not uh, 28 years of the same experience, but I'm a uh, I'm a previous uh, materials engineer for the state DOT and a uh, assistant chief engineer when I left a few years ago. So uh, we suspect that in addition to being a regular webinar Wednesday uh, attendee here, that you're, you're uh, here to acquire important best practices on how to construct patches uh, how to monitor or inspect patch construction, and to ask pothole patching questions. So I don't want to um, prevent you from being able to do that. So I'm, I'm, um, I love to see your smiling faces, but I'm going to minimize that part on my screen so that that we can move through the uh, presentation. Uh, today's agenda. Not only are we going to talk about that. Uh, important part of uh, why do potholes form, why do uh, we need patches. We're going to talk about uh, matching the uh, treatment type with the pavement candidate. So we'll do some review there. Talk a little bit about pavement distresses and uh, what, what indicates that a uh, pavement is a good candidate for partial depth patching or full depth patching. And we'll also talk about those pavement construction best practices. So if you have a have a question about something particular as we as we move through, please again don't hesitate to ask those questions. <clears throat> Our learning outcomes for today. We expect that by the end of the uh, our session that you'll be able to explain the purpose of pothole patching and repair to describe appropriate pavement conditions that indicate a partial depth repair or partial depth patch is appropriate and the same for a full depth patch. Uh, you'll be able to select appropriate projects for partial depth patching and full depth patching and then identify best practices for properly completing those repairs and what the uh, inspection factors are when monitoring patch installation. You may have uh, crews that do this within your uh, agency, or you may be uh, implementing these patches uh, with your forces. I know that we have some uh, contractor folks uh, on the line. So please, your experience is valuable and very welcome to be be presented here. So what is the purpose of a pavement repair? So I uh, ordinarily would ask you to be uh, filling in some information here, but the, the purpose of a pavement repair primarily is to repair localized areas of failed pavement. So this is a, uh, a small scale but important pavement repair that restores the roadway's functionality and serviceability. That means it's it's pleasant to ride on and is a pretreatment before the application of a, a, a preservation treatment. So uh, this is primarily how we teach the course that there may be localized areas of repair that are necessary before the, the global pavement uh, project can be implemented. So uh, we're talking about identifying some very vulnerable spots along that roadway that need to be repaired prior to uh, another project being implemented. And that maintains the cost effectiveness of doing that, that uh, low cost pavement improvement. So if you're uh, into chip seals or microsurfacing or thin asphalt overlays, you know that those treatments do not address structural instability. So uh, they would only mask that distress. So we need to do some localized repairs prior to prior to uh, those projects being implemented. The types of 
pavement repair options that are available include all of these, and that is base and sub-base repairs. So that is uh, beneath the typical asphalt or concrete pavement structure. Uh, we also uh, talk about partial depth repairs, full depth repairs, dowel bar retrofitting, which on concrete pavements as slabs, uh, their joints deteriorate and their load transfer capacity uh, decreases. Dowel bar retrofitting can enhance that load transfer and, and keep those concrete pavements serviceable. Uh, and we also have slab stabilization, under sealing and sub sealing to restore uh, that load carrying capacity and to um, assist us in repairs. Our primary uh, focus today is gonna be on those middle two partial depth patches and full depth patches. Uh, but we we have uh, information available on on each of these treatments through the Nevada LTAP uh, and also through some uh, NHI courses that we teach that are available to uh, DOTs across the country. So if you're if you're more interested in in the next step, uh, we can assist in uh, directing you to that. So. Uh, how do you know repair is the right option? Uh, and so typically, as we uh, think about uh, distresses and what needs to be done with them, uh, we need to identify the type, extent, and severity of the distress. So that is that is how we usually talk about pavement condition. And so if we say that a pavement is experiencing um, moderate severity fatigue cracking, that would satisfy that uh, line of uh, questioning there or that, that <clears throat> information that we need. Uh, we also need to know where the depth of the distress extends to. Where is the problem and how deep is it? We need to consider what is the remaining service life of the pavement around us. Is this a fairly young pavement or is it uh, planned for some, some form of rehabilitation over the next few years? And we are more or less uh, trying to hold it together uh, until, that, until that project comes along. Uh, seasons and weather play a uh, factor in our considerations about patching. Uh, in addition to the traffic volume, how heavy is the roadway being traveled? What are our uh, limitations as far as lane closure times, uh, work times, and uh, the the amount of time that we can implement a lane closure? Is that uh, 30 minutes, is it two hours, is it five hours, six hours? What is the uh, time requirement that, that we're able to get into that location and work? Uh, any questions before we uh, go further? If you all have any questions, you can put it in the chat box or you can take yourself off mute and ask. Absolutely. I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, thank you, Nicole. If you'll help me monitor that, I would appreciate it. I sure will. <clears throat> Very good. Okay, so what conditions can be addressed with uh, these types of repair techniques? So we would typically be talking about surface delamination when you have a uh, the top layer of material come unbonded from what's underneath it and uh, deteriorate, delaminate from there. We would also be talking about top-down cracking, either longitudinal or alligator cracking uh, to some extent. So uh, these types of distresses are appropriate. Small potholes, uh, 
uh, surface and layer delamination. So if something is happening uh, beneath the surface to delaminate a layer, uh, that could uh, pose a structural issue requiring a, uh, a patch. Uh, severe weathering and raveling, and I want to highlight the term severe here uh, because uh, if it's moderate or light, uh, low severity, weathering and, and raveling, those uh, issues can be addressed with much cheaper uh, alternatives. Uh, and block cracking, the same uh, could, <clears throat> the same should be said about block cracking, that uh, if you have low severity block cracking, uh, other treatments can be applied there. So it's about identifying, again, the type, severity, and extent of the distress. Uh, that needs to be uh, covered. My rule of thumb for extent is uh, if we have no more than 10% of the pavement affected uh, by these structural, localized structural distresses, then we can patch effectively and then still apply a preservation treatment, uh, something uh, lower cost that can preserve the functionality of that roadway and minimize the, the rate of additional distresses. So uh, as we move into uh, the particulars of partial depth patching uh, for asphalt pavements, those candidates would be surface and layer delaminations, severe weathering and raveling, block cracking, and top-down cracking. Uh, so these are all uh, distresses that do not extend throughout the pavement structure. That is uh, coincidentally why we address them with partial depth patching. For concrete pavements, partial depth patches would be appropriate for those distresses that again don't extend throughout the top uh, or that only exist in the top half of that concrete pavement and those are typically uh, joint spalling situations associated with joint inserts, uh, joint spalling caused by the intrusion of incompressibles. So if a, a joint filler has uh, allowed sand or grit or uh, some aggregate particles to get in there and uh, as the pavement expands and contracts, those incompressibles prevent it from uh, responding as it's intended to uh, Spalling can occur. Uh, those are treatable with partial depth patches. And spalling associated with localized scaling, weak concrete, clay balls, or high steel. So some material defects there, construction defects. Any questions about these? If you follow the pattern, we'll be talking about full depth patching candidates. Uh, and good candidates for full depth patches um, for asphalt pavements here. We're talking about lawn, uh, alligator cracking, either low, medium, or high severity. So uh, we typically uh, recommend that any alligator cracking be uh, treated with full depth patching. Longitudinal and transverse crack can be treated by other things until it gets to high severity cracks. So these would be uh, very wide, uh, three quarters of an inch or larger. Uh, if you have uh, previous patches that are failing, so uh, if you're going to have to repatch an area, uh, that typically calls for uh, full depth patches. And again, potholes, medium or high severity potholes are good candidates for full depth patches. <clears throat> are you ready for a test? So I'm gonna ask uh, somebody to uh, walk along beside of me and talk if you, if you don't mind. Is somebody uh, able to unmute and talk with me? Anybody? We're going to look at some photos and let you uh, 
decide is this a candidate for partial depth patching or full depth patching. So here's candidate number one. I'll show you that it's not too hard. What are we, what are we observing here? There's alligator cracking. It is alligator cracking. Uh, absolutely. You see the pattern of, <clears throat> excuse me. You see that pattern that looks like an alligator skin there. So that is uh, where the term alligator cracking came from. Um, could be crocodile cracking, I suppose, down in uh, Australia or saltwater conditions. So uh, what do we also see there? A pothole. It's a pothole. That's right. And it has been previously patched. So would this be, based on what we've talked about, would this be a candidate for partial depth patching or full depth patching? Full depth. Full depth. Very good. Very good. Let's look at the next one. What do we see here? I'm probably your least qualified person to be uh, speaking <laughs> as, a, as a local elected official, but um, uh, is that uh, longitudinal? No, it I'm is sorry. in the longitudinal direction for sure. Yes. This is an uh, example of delamination. Thank you. Yes. And it has been previously patched. And so we see that the patch is deteriorating. So based on what we've talked about, I don't know that I would call that uh, moderate or severe uh, patch deterioration. Uh, do you think this would be a candidate for partial or full depth patching? If I remember correctly, uh, the delamination uh, typically would be uh, partial, but uh, I, I'm not sure. As you said, you didn't think it was severe, so it would still be partial. Okay, very good. I was giving you, I was giving you some talking points there, so thank you. You also absolutely. Have, we have one comment in the chat. Uh, chat. How raster said full death. Okay. So this is, this is one of those issues where I would want to know a little bit more about the, the pavement. How extensive is, is this? What else am I seeing there? Uh, but certainly uh, this is a candidate for some type of patching. Uh, so uh, perhaps a core to determine how deep the distress is. What do you think? What do you think about this? Uh, situation. This is the transition between a concrete pavement at an intersection and the asphalt approach. Well, there's a few different spots there, but um, is that raveling? Uh, so it, it, raveling it, is when we lose um, some significant uh, aggregate out of the out of the matrix there of the, sure. the pavement. So it's a surface distress primarily. Uh, this would be uh, some structural distress. This is an indication as you're approaching that concrete pavement, uh, we have some movement happening either in the uh, base or, or sub base and the uh, pavement is experiencing some localized structural distress there. These are longitudinal and transverse uh, cracks. It's, it's almost developing into a pothole. So uh, within a some time, I would expect a nice, pothole yeah. to open up there. So looking at the donut now, I've drawn a donut there. So, uh, or a bullseye. Um, so yes, this would be a candidate for full depth patching. Uh, and my annotation is still there. All right. Okay. So how about this road? This road, we, we see um, a transverse crack. Uh, extending over to the yellow line and we see some longitudinal cracks uh, along the skip line there, uh, but nothing 
um, nothing of a structural nature. So would this be a candidate for partial or full depth patching partial. or some other treatment? Sorry, I didn't let you finish your question. I thought you'd stopped uh, partial. Partial, okay. So based on what we've talked about, yeah, minor distresses would be a partial depth repair. Uh, there are other treatments though that would treat something like this. So this would be neither of those. Um, this pavement is in fairly good condition with some um, with some minor cracking in it. So we would be looking at a, a crack treatment of some sort, crack sealing, uh, crack filling, uh, but not necessarily patching. So I, I threw you a trick question there to, uh, to some extent. Uh, very good. Thank you, Lyles. How about this one? This is not a trick question. I won't hog all the all the fun if anybody else wants to participate, but I also understand people are in different circumstances. They can't say anything. So I'm willing to to <laughs> be be the guinea pig. Um, I, I obviously, um, alligator cracking, it does look like it's becoming a pothole there in the middle. Um, there's some transverse as well um, that, that seem to be, for, you know, extending further over. It does look like it uh, maybe previously has been patched. Um, I couldn't speak to whether or not that was, that may be a full depth that had been there. Um, and so uh, I think, as you said early on, um, I don't know when it's uh, timing, when it's expected to see a full resurfacing, uh, but that might be, you might want to have a uh, short-term fix um, because obviously uh, the, the previous full patch wasn't fully effective. But um, if, if you were just to say, what can we do? What should we do? in a perfect world it should be full depth but uh, again you might want to do something short term for uh, getting you by until it's fully resurfaced very good lyles that is um, excellent uh, i agree with everything you said that is alligator cracking it's developing into a, a pothole for sure um, and a full depth patch would be the appropriate treatment there so uh, considering all those things you said uh, in an ideal world, that would be uh, a full depth patch candidate. Very good. I believe that is uh, the end of our testing. So thank you, Lyles. Um, I want to I want to cover the steps for constructing semi permanent patching. Uh, and there's some key words there in the title. Uh, I want you to consider that patches should be semi-permanent, meaning that uh, when we place a patch, we want it to last uh, the remaining life of that pavement. And if you if you um, if you deal with risk and you understand that uh, we we try to manage our risk as government agencies and uh, apply emphasis where we need to in, in the most risky areas. I want you to think about uh, these locations that are requiring a, uh, a patch as some of the most vulnerable spots on that roadway. They're localized because they are the first in that, in that pavement to experience this kind of deterioration. And so, um, the best analogy that I have uh, to talk about there is uh, a cancer in our body. So uh, when we detect a cancer, uh, that is a hopefully a localized uh, distress that we that we feel. And it, again, I don't want to speak lightly to that, but it is. Um, when, when we have our uh, treatment assigned, you know, we're, uh, we're very emphatic that that is an important step in the, in the process. We take that um, uh, diagnosis very seriously, 
and we you know we do what the doctor says so that is um that's the case we find ourselves in uh and when we uh, ultimately if we have to go in and, and be operated on to have that cancer removed when the when the uh, doctor comes back out of the room when that surgeon steps back out uh we generally, as a family of that loved one, want to hear the doctor say, we got it all. And so that is the analogy for what we're doing with this uh, pavement repair is we're trying to remove that vulnerable spot of uh, deficient material, correct the issue and uh, replace it or have it heal in a in a way that is as good as new and so uh, these are the steps that we implement in constructing semi-permanent patches uh, to achieve that whole pavement life uh, for the repair so the first step is marking those patch boundaries and so that includes identifying some good material that we're willing to take out in order to um, to remove that bad material. Uh, the second step is to cut the boundaries, and we're going to go through each one of these independently, so I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Uh, the third will be to remove the defective material. The fourth will be to repair the foundation so that we shore up. Uh, the footing for that repair. Uh, number five is to apply a tack coat to uh, to get that material to bond to the to the old pavement. Um, the sixth step is to place the patch material, and there are several uh, important facets to that step. So we'll cover those. Uh, compact the patch, and then finally clean up so that we um, reopen that stretch of pavement and uh, traffic can can have their road back. So uh, any questions about those uh, eight steps? All right. So number one, match or uh, mark the patch boundary. So this is um, this is an important step. There are several considerations to think about. <clears throat> Primarily, we should think about, uh, you know, that uh, Stephen Covey statement, begin with the end in mind. Uh, compaction is one of our final steps, but we should consider uh, creating a patch uh, that we have a really good chance of, of achieving compaction on. So. Uh, we want to make the patch as wide as the compaction equipment so that it can have full access to that material, whether we're using a roller or whether we're using a uh, plate compactor or how we're planning to achieve compaction on this on this patch. We should be thinking about uh, sizing the patch so that uh, we have a, a good likelihood of success. Uh, we also need to consider the saw cutting operation. Where will the saw have access? Can they get all the way to the edge of the pavement? Do we need to uh, not extend into the curb? Uh, what's what's going on there? We also should be thinking about uh, extending those patch boundaries. Typically, we say a foot to 18 inches beyond the uh, visible limits of the distress. So uh, extending the patch boundaries to get into that good pavement so that we have uh, a sound uh, boundary for the new patch. We should also consider where surface utilities are located. Uh, using the 811 system is certainly important. Uh, there's also some engineering judgment uh, that comes into play. Uh, the next three steps, I think, are uh, equally important. Uh, we always want to have square corners. We want to avoid any acute angles because it's very difficult to achieve compaction in those kinds of um, locations. We also want to avoid cutting in the wheel path. 
or near the pavement edge. So uh, we may recommend doing a lot of half lane patches so that you go to the center of the lane and cut to the edge or the longitudinal joint, depending on where the distress is, uh, just to avoid having a patch boundary in the wheel path. Uh, we also want to keep those patches square uh, with the edge of the pavement. So place uh, transverse and longitudinally to the pavement edge. So a full rectangle. Uh, so this is a bad example of a patch. Uh, I, I've got one teaching um, partner who says this looks like his uh, high power deer rifle uh, sort of in profile there. And uh, uh, it's got the sights on the top and a uh, uh, ammunition magazine on the bottom and the, and the stock extending toward us. So uh, that's his impression. Uh, the joke I make is that the contractor who placed this got paid by the corner. Uh, but this is a an example of uh, where something could have been done better. Does anybody want to offer a suggestion of how this could have been improved? I'll give you one. You, you said uh, try to avoid just the the wheel path, uh, so uh, it could have been extended to to be further than uh, just the uh, the wheel path. Absolutely, half a lane or or full lane. All right. This. Go ahead. Uh, Chuck Crabtree says should be a single rectangle is what Chuck Crabtree put in chat. Very good. So this would be my ideal of uh, how to improve that. And maybe the uh, the red line there could be uh, uh, distinguished a little bit better to be in the center of the lane. But uh, making that one complete uh, rectangle would give us uh, optimum ability to be able to get uh, good compaction around there. When we see these uh, marks, and I'll try to annotate here a little bit. Um, when we see these uh, shaded areas, you can tell that there's been some rain and that these areas are holding a little bit of water uh, throughout. So that's an indication that we don't have very good uh, density or compaction in that in that patch. And so uh, this was a vulnerable spot before it is still a vulnerable spot. So um, that is uh, that is what I'm uh, calling a uh, an unsuccessful patch. So typically when we when we do uh, saw cutting, we want to saw those uh, boundary lines. Uh, full depth. We use typically uh, diamond saw blades. Uh, we find that these um, self-propelled units are much more successful at creating the patch boundary rather than uh, circular hand saws. Uh, typically, there's a lot of movement and uh, instability in those. So, um, and a full depth cut helps prevent damage to the adjacent HMA uh material during removal so that's the that's the primary purpose in uh saw cutting before a patch is so that we do not damage the adjacent material uh, any questions uh next is removing the defective material so our objectives in doing this are to minimize damage to the surrounding pavement and the underlying base and so we typically begin the removal process in the middle of that cut so you can you can see uh in that bottom picture that the uh, boundaries have been marked and pat and cut i'm sorry um a few inches outside of the visible distress and we're beginning the removal process right in the center of that marked boundary. Uh, the top picture isn't as clear, but they're using a, uh, a spoon or a, uh, uh, 
a single uh, excavating device there to to remove some of that material uh, as they're as they're beginning their material removal. Uh, once we have the opening uh, largely created, we want to remove all loose material greater than a half inch, and so that is um, that is important. We don't want loose material. Uh, in there that would affect our ability to place and compact that new material. Uh, fourth, uh, our fourth step is foundation repair. And this is not a great example of a uh, an excavated patch area, but it is a, a good opportunity for us to talk about the importance of making that base material sound again. So. Uh, we may have to uh, remove uh, base material that is um, overly saturated. Uh, we may have to install drainage as a part of this uh, repair step. We may uh, install uh, edge uh, pavement drains, uh, do something to get rid of the water. And, and that is uh, often a an indication in any kind of engineering application when we're thinking about uh, installing a good uh, serviceable piece of infrastructure we have to uh, maintain that drainage in a desirable state so control the water make sure it goes where we want it to and it does not exist where we do not want it to and so uh, the problem with water is that it makes our material weaker uh, just in its presence typically. So uh, wet material would have a lower shear strength than uh, a dry material. Um, so we don't want to we don't want to disturb more than we have to. But again, uh, taking out some good material in order to preserve the, the repair is uh, likely important or uh, likely going to happen. Uh, these other uh, considerations exist. Uh, if the base is defective, remove it and subgrade soil, replace with virgin uh, material, recompact it using appropriate compaction equipment. Uh, any areas with standing water or saturated materials must be allowed to dry or install that, that drainage fix. Uh, remove any saturated pumping material and replace that. That may be some uh, stabilization that happens within the subgrade. So we can get into some very large uh, patch situations, as you can see in some of these some of these photos. Have you experienced uh, issues like this? Anyone care to care to add context? All right, uh, so the next step, once we have our foundation reconfigured, we're gonna apply a tack coat. So this can be a typical SS1 emulsion. Uh, you want to either spray or brush the edges. We don't typically pour the asphalt emulsion into those locations. We wanna apply them to get a good uniform coverage. Uh, you can see in that top picture that we have uh, sprayed not only the uh, vertical faces, but uh, some of the horizontal area at the bottom of the patch just to get a good bond uh, and uh, try to provide some impermeable joints at those locations. Uh, step six is to place the material. Now, uh, we haven't talked much about the material that should be used in patches, but um, the, the typical ideal use is to have a hot mix asphalt patch material for asphalt pavements. Uh, for concrete pavements, we would typically want to patch with a concrete material, so some sort of uh, cementitious concrete. It could be an epoxy type concrete um, that has a uh, quick set characteristic, but we 
uh, typically do not recommend patching concrete pavements with asphalt materials uh, because those would be considered a temporary patch at best, uh, eventually needing to be replaced. So that may be a concern if you're in foul weather or if you're in uh, a situation where uh, timing would not uh, allow uh, delivery of uh, concrete materials. If you're doing nighttime work uh, on a special call out when uh, concrete plants are not available, that kind of mixture uh, isn't there. So uh, just be aware that your material choice uh, can be driven by what is available at the time that, that we're having to make these repairs. Um, we should check that the patch material meets the approved mix design so that when you're when you call the asphalt plant and you ask for uh, 15 tons of material that you know what you're going to be getting, what the aggregate size is, uh, is it going to be workable? Uh, we should uh, try to get the material placed when it is at least above 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, below that temperature, we, we lose the ability to compact it properly, so we need to place it while it's uh, hot. Uh, we may place uh, small patches manually, as you uh, see in that bottom right picture. Uh, but for larger patches, we may actually bring out a, a paving crew uh, to place that material. It may add a little bit of cost, but again, we're replacing a vulnerable uh, location, so we need to use our best construction techniques. Uh, anytime we place asphalt mixtures, we want to avoid segregation. That is, the uh, the larger particles want to be uh, with the larger particles and the smaller particles um, stay together. So we want to make sure that the mix is a, a good blend. Um, and we need to keep in mind that uh, when we're manually placing uh, the material we're going to get about 35 percent uh, 30 to 35 percent roll down so there is a a need to place more material in that space than what we think it would hold so there there is going to be some compaction during uh, the next step that will uh, move those materials around and and uh, energize them to to compress the seventh step, I've talked about this a, a lot. This to me is uh, the most important part of the patching process. Uh, compaction in any other uh, asphalt pavement is a critical step to ensure that that patch material is impermeable. And so by compacting it, we force those aggregate particles to move past one another and to make those void spaces between them uh, much, much smaller than they, than they begin to be. And by making them smaller, we make them less interconnected. So that prevents water from being able to penetrate our patches. And uh, if you remember our uh, high powered rifle uh, patch example, we saw that that patch had some permeability and continued to hold um, hold water. Uh, so in order to get compaction, we may use a uh, steel wheel roller. We may vibrate that material if it's uh, appropriate and we're not damaging the existing pavement around there. Um, we also uh, may use a plate compactor. Uh, depending on the size of the patch. Uh, we want to remove excess material that is shoved beyond the patch boundaries and continue to roll that uh, material until we get terminal density. So where we're where we have achieved all the density that we can we can get there. So uh, <clears throat> the eighth step is to clean up. And so this uh, considers that uh, we've been working in a location and 
uh, part of working, just like uh, as we're making a cake or, or working in the kitchen, whatever that may be, uh, there's going to be some uh, cleanup. We also need to make sure that we've placed that patch to be consistent with the other riding surface around us. So uh, we want it to be smooth and not uh, take those impact loads as uh, or not create any impact loads as uh, vehicles cross the threshold of the patch. Uh, all right, so we are at our conclusion. Uh, what have you learned? Hopefully you understand the purpose of pothole patching and repair, what the differences might be for a partial depth patch or a full depth patch. Um, so tell me what you picked up. Uh, again, I'd like for somebody to unmute and talk with me. What is one best practice you recommend for any of these? Marking patch boundaries, cutting patches, removing defective materials, placing patches, and compacting. Anything that you picked up. I'm really interested in hearing from the contractors. Have, have what I've said uh, all been hooey and idealistic uh, pie in the sky stuff, or is this uh, what I'm saying true? Remember, you can take yourself off mute, or you can type in the chat box and I can read it out. All right, a quiet group. Well, hopefully you understand that uh, marking patch boundaries outside of the distressed area is a good idea. 12 to 18 inches. We need to cut those patches to minimize disturbance to uh, other materials. We need to get all the material. You remember my uh, analogy uh, that we want to hear the surgeon say, we got it all. Um, we need to place those patches with uh, best construction techniques, knowing that we had a vulnerable spot and we need to uh, provide that stability uh, back there and compacting is is certainly important. So with yeah. that, yep, go ahead. I, again, this is more rudimentary than, than uh, some other folks might provide, but I, I really appreciated the, the analysis of the partial depth and, and full depth of what conditions, uh, because so often uh, as a local elected official, you know, folks are approaching us and, you know, suggest that uh, uh, just patching a, a uh, uh, with a partial depth, or certainly not using that terminology on on a pothole, um, is is never adequate. Um, in uh, maybe to our, our road department's mind, but uh, the public sometimes is is poorly informed and just thinks that they just need to go out there and put a cold patch down and 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 fill it in. And and for me to have a better uh, uh, terminology used to respond to constituents is really helpful in advocating for my road department. Um, uh, I, right. I never questioned them in that sense, but for me to better advocate on their behalf to constituents is, is very helpful. So I really appreciate it. That's great. Thank you, Lyles. Uh, 